This episode of No Filter was brought to you by HelloFresh. Inspiration delivered. There are a lot of people who feel moral outrage towards women who have chosen not to have kids, that they feel like they're doing something that's literally wrong. Do you have kids? If you ask Tori Shepherd this question, she will consider telling you that she lost her uterus in a tragic fishing accident. Because somehow that reason feels less shocking than her actual answer, which is just that she never really felt like it. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, the podcast where you get to hear a very candid conversation with someone who has a story to tell. Tori is 42, and she's a remarkable journalist from Adelaide. Tori and so many women like her across the country and the world are judged hard and fast for the fact that they're not mothers. Most days, in fact. They're called all sorts of names. Names like selfish, unnatural, barren, weird, cat-loving, and even witchy. They have to deal with dinner party judging, workplace sneering, and family prying. And they have to constantly answer a variation of the tired old question, so... Why don't you have kids? This is despite the fact that the statistics show that women in Australia are having children later, if at all. And yet so often as a society, women without kids seem to arouse suspicion and confusion and even condescension from people who just do not understand their life choices or, in fact, their life. Tori has just recently written a book about this called On Freedom. It's about women who are childless by choice, like she is, and she joins me today to talk about it. Do you know, I've seen you on television. Today's the first time we've met, but I've seen you on television. Uh, we both used to kind of be on similar... Staring down barrels in different yeah, cities. Yeah, exactly. On Paul Murray, on Sky News and various things as sort of social commentators. And so I've followed your career for a long time. And when this book landed... I was really surprised because I just assumed you had kids. Right. Which was the Isn't whole premise that interesting? of the book. <laughs> and I just assumed that you were married with kids and living in Adelaide. That would be the normal thing to be doing, apparently. You talk about choice because the choice about whether or not to have kids is a really new one in terms of evolution, right? Mm. It's only in the last couple of generations that we've had access to reproductive technology, contraception, abortion, even sex education. Mm. And so you talk about how that choice is freedom, but it is also, as your mum put it, can be a burden. Yeah. So I opened the book with my mum because I thought she went through a really interesting transition. She went from this sort of joke of like, oh, I'm just going to replace your pills with sugar because she thought, just stop overthinking it. Just have the kids. You'll be happier because that was her experience. She never thought about it. She just went ahead, got married and had kids and that worked out fine. So why couldn't I do the same? And so that's where we started talking about me not wanting kids. And then she got to a point where she was like, wow, actually, maybe if I had had all this choice about not having to give up my career, get married, have kids, not having to uh, talk to the in-laws about when it happened, not having to talk so much about how many to have or when to start, I might have done things differently. Like, it's really hard for you. You're overthinking it all and you have... I think I use the analogy of, like, I always have this thing in the olive oil section of the supermarket. I'm like, do I buy local? Do I want organic? I don't know what cold-pressed is. What, Spanish? Yeah, exactly. Extra virgin? What yeah. about just regular virgin? Yeah, see, there's got to be a virgin joke in here somewhere. because <gasps> Too much choice. <laughs> too much choice. And that complication, along with the stigmas for women whether they don't have kids, do have kids, have too many kids, don't have enough kids, have kids too late. Ah, It's enough to do your head in. How old are you? I'm 42. So I've got a girlfriend who is now in her early 50s and she said with this new reproductive technology, it's like there's never a time when she's just allowed to not have kids. Mm. Everyone's like, you could still get a donor egg, you could still do this, you could still do that. And she's like, no, stop telling me that I could. She has mixed feelings about it, but she's accepted it and she loves her life now and she doesn't have regrets. Mm. But no one will let her just be in no. her child-free state. I've heard this from so many women. I mean, I keep getting it from strangers and it's Uber drivers. You're, oh, you'll change your mind. Or if you tried the the vaginal steaming, which is a real thing that somebody 
suggested. How does that help? the ways. Oh, so, assuming yeah, that you've been trying and yes, you just can't. Yeah, try everything else. Didn't you find the right guy? Uh, and it's these constant, <laughs> relentless comments from strangers that all imply... Oh, really? Your life has kind of gone to shit. But I'm trying to help you get it back to a reasonable place with this ridiculous suggestion. And I think saying that your friend is in her early 50s, I mean, you'd look at me and go, oh, I think she's past her best. <laughs> <laughs> that ship has sailed. Yeah, that ship has sailed. No. Nah. Um, but no, because people really can't seem to understand the idea that it's that I'm okay. It's okay. Did you ever want to have kids when you were younger? Like what did you imagine grown-up Tori's life to look like? So I actually went back and checked with some high school friends particularly. Like did I – was I doing all these things? And they're like, no, you were always the one who never talked about having kids. But obviously as a girl I had the pram and the doll and I have this thing which I sort of assume every woman has where you kind of – you know, when you learn something – new, like you have an epiphany about how to shave your legs or do your eyebrows properly, you kind of want to pass some stuff on. Or when I read, you know, wise words in a book, I kind of want to, you know, pass that on to someone. So I don't know where that urge sort of fits Evolution, in. Evolution, I guess. Yeah. Just that natural part of humanity of wanting to pass something of yourself on. But it's not particularly rational. And I think it probably just got in there because of years of conditioning. And so I got to a point where I wanted to want kids. I just thought it'd make everyone happy. So I was married. My husband, now ex, hadn't wanted kids, but he was, you know, men don't think about it. As when much did you as guys get do. married? How old were you? I should know this off the top of my head. And it would have been maybe 30, 31. Yeah. And we'd been together for a while before that. And had you talked about kids yeah. when you got together? Yeah, we had. And he didn't want kids at, at all. My mistake, I think, in retrospect was men haven't thought about it as much as we have. They don't think about the fertility cliff like we do. Because there isn't one, really. No. And so I probably should have gone back and checked with him. You know, like, are you sure? Are we cool? We're still on the same thing here, right? So I probably could have done that. And then all of a sudden I realised he did want kids. Oh. Yeah, so we had that conversation. How many years afterwards? Well, this this was when I was about 36 and I kind of went, fuck it, let's give it a go. So we did all the, the normal things that you to do and it, you know, it didn't... Like sex. Like sex at the right times. Yeah. And I just, I just hated it. I felt such a relief every time I got my period and so that was a really mm. turbulent time. You know, I don't think anyone else knew that we were trying but obviously he had now started imagining this alternate future for us and every time I tried to put myself in that I just felt dread honestly and you know there's never one reason for these things but in the end that was a that was a deal breaker I, I couldn't keep trying and it got to I would have been probably almost a year where we would probably have to go and see someone and that was it I was just like I can't can't do it anymore and that was part of the deal. Breaking. That's pretty much the deal breaker. How are you going to feel if he goes on to become a dad? I think I'll actually feel relief because then it's not my fault that he hasn't become a dad. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, it's really hard to dig into your brain and try and work out how you would feel. But no, I think I would just feel relief. I think, as I said, I, I wish that I'd checked in with him more often along along the way and I should have had more conscious recognition that men sometimes don't have that emotional intelligence. So this would just, that would be the final, like, good, well, it's okay. I didn't screw up his life. You write so beautifully about some of the judgments that are placed on women without kids. Can you describe some of those that you've had to contend with? So... A lot of small talk is based around kids or football, but I don't do football either, so I'm I'm hopeless at the You're whole thing. You're screwed. Yeah. And I don't think any of these people are bad at all. I think they're well-meaning people who go, oh, hi, great, so do you have kids? No, no, I don't, and either never wanted them or whatever. And they'll just press on and on with the why nots. And for me, I just always found that just annoying. It's like, come on, you know, we're... As a journo, you know, often I'm sat next to someone at a function 
where something interesting might be discussed. Can we just move along? And then I guess my shift really came when I realised that all my friends who were trying to have kids were getting asked the same questions while they were, you know, failing at IVF. Or So that's a terrible way to put it. Well, IVF wasn't working for them. That is how you feel though, yeah. when you're going through it. Yeah. And, you know, having miscarriages, which is, is another thing that happens so often that we don't really talk about. And they're getting pushed on these same sort of questions as well when they're actually going through a pretty hard time. You make a really good case for the fact that we've just got to stop asking women because I assume after you got married, it was like, you're pregnant yet? You're yeah. pregnant yet? And then I keep hearing from women that once you've had one, you're getting it about the second one. Oh, yeah. And if you've had your first late and there's a smaller chance of you getting the second one, that's that's really difficult. I think, you know, you can ask about it. I guess it's just more reading the social cues and realising that you might be delving into someone's trauma. You talk about some of the things that, that people have assumed about you and, and women who don't have kids, that you're unnatural, barren, weird, selfish, career-obsessed, cat-loving, a bit witchy. <laughs> Well, the witchy thing is a real thing, you know. There are all these sort of ancient myths about women who didn't have kids were seen as the old crones who might come and steal yours. And you sort of think it's gone away. And then you get the treatment of Julia Gillard, obviously, who was also called a witch as well as deliberately barren. Talk about that for a minute, just about how she was kind of the first high-profile woman that we had to grapple with in that way. Because yeah. some people might not remember how that played itself out when she rose to prominence. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, she was an atheist and a barren woman. It's the worst word. It's almost as bad as breeder, but we might come to that later. And there was this gorgeous portrait of her done in her home with an empty fruit bowl. And this fruit bowl became the symbol of her empty womb and the fact that she wasn't, you know, maintaining perfectly polished oranges. And that morphed into the phrase from former Liberal Senator Bill Heffernan that she was deliberately barren. Deliberately, deliberately barren. Deliberately Like barren. as if choosing not to have children is an act of aggression. Yes, like she somehow scorched earth her womb. And then it didn't stop there because there were comments from other politicians at the time, including from within Labor, which were along the lines of, oh, yeah, old Senator Bill, he shouldn't have said that, but oh, she's not really going to get families. She won't really necessarily have the empathy that's needed. Uh, you know, how, how do we know that she's going to actually be able to understand women? Um, and all these ideas that she was somehow incomplete and, of course, all these questions that would never be asked about a male leader. If there was a patron saint of women who didn't have children, it would probably be Jennifer Aniston. Yes. <laughs> and there's the sad Jen sad myth that has woven itself through her whole public life, I guess. Ever starting... since she met Brad Pitt, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there would have to be, let's just say, 3,897 front pages of glossy magazines dedicated to, is she, isn't she, oh, she's not, oh, she might never be, oh, sad Jen. Um, and it started getting talked about a little bit in literature as this sad Jen phenomenon because she would quite often be coming out, I'm fine. No, 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 guys, I'm, I'm totally happy. But I guess a large part of society cannot comprehend the idea of a woman single, I don't know if she's still single now, by the way, but, you know, Brad Pitt left you, you must be miserable and embittered forever, and a woman without children as feeling happy and fulfilled in her life. And it just it got ridiculous. Jen going, mate, I'm cool, stop this sad Jen stuff. Oh, sad Jen, so stop sad Jen. It became almost quite performative, like there was no room for her or other women like, say, Renee Zellweger, mm to be able to say, I don't want to have children. I mean, maybe they really do. Mm. But there was there seemed like there was no option for them to remain likeable and accessible to the mainstream and their fan base and not express some desire to be among the future childed. Yeah, no, that's a really good way of putting it. And I don't know whether they've got marketing research guys out there who say, look, yeah, you know, this film is going to rake in $3 million less if we don't have them expressing some form of desire for motherhood. That may well be the case. There's, um, since I wrote the book, I came across this big study that talks about how there are a lot of people who feel moral outrage towards women who have chosen not to have kids, that they feel like they're doing something that's literally wrong. 
Yes, yeah. I was going to say a sort of a disapproving, mm. but but moral outrage. Moral outrage, and the, why this, is that? That sense of disapproval, or that you? How dare you? Well, you're bucking what's seen as a norm, but I also think, and this is mentioned in some of the research, but I don't I don't know how you'd sort of pin it down as a hard science that you're implicitly and without meaning to challenging that person's choice. So you're causing them a bit of internal conflict. So even though if I say to you, no, no, I, I chose not to have children. I'm not in any way you know, casting aspersions. But there are people who might go, oh, well, I never thought it was a choice. I just did it. Are you now saying I should have done something differently or thought about it in a different way? So I think it's just triggering that little thing and then it gets them defensive. When people feel defensive, they might start judging things as morally outrageous. It's so true, that idea of if you choose not to have children, somehow that's an indictment on my mm. decision to choose to have children. Yeah. And I, I really wish people wouldn't feel like that because it's not that. Do people think you hate children? People think I hate children. Do you it, hate it, children? I don't hate children. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say couldn't eat a whole one, but I've already used that joke, so tuck it back. I um, know, but back to that, i will <laughs> interrupt you for a second. I know a lot of women... Who throw that away mm. as a as a kind of a you couldn't eat a whole one? Yeah. I've heard that from a number of times. I think it's a defensive mechanism it of some kind. Must be mm. to sort of. Is it also saying, "Don't pity me, don't judge me, don't assume you know me"? Yeah, and maybe trying to inject some humour when you worry that people think that you're this bitter, hateful person. So this is kind of where the whole genesis of this was from. Was I went to various baby showers where people who know me relatively well would say things like oh but you hate babies it's like this is my mate's baby shower like like, what and I go oh what do I do that comes across as hating babies well choosing not to have one that's enough to make it seem to some people as though you hate them I guess it's like would you like strawberry or chocolate and someone chooses chocolate well therefore you don't like strawberry hate strawberry mm-hmm yeah, but it's very simplistic and doesn't doesn't allow for that spectrum, does mm. it? And do you know, I mean, the, it, it's probably not helped by the fact that there is part of this this smug, child-free movement that is very anti. Lionel Shriver has written quite a lot about it. Um, you know, ugh, messy, disgusting, snotty children. I wouldn't want them messing up my apartment. So, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't women without children who don't, you know, who do hate children. That, you know, they're out there. It's there are just, also women with children who hate children. Well, yeah, and a lot of people don't like other people's children. And there are women with children who kill their children and abuse their children. So yeah. it's not like somehow giving birth makes you a better person. No, and that's that kind of sacred side of motherhood, which does a disservice to people who choose not to have children, who can't have children, but I think also does a massive disservice to the women themselves because you're no longer the woman, you're the mother that starts to usurp your entire identity and people forget that you had these other identities. I did this fascinating chat with a, um, a funeral director who was talking about how they have massive difficulties when, say, middle-aged kids come in because mum's died and half the time they don't know what she ever did before she had kids. So mm-hmm. they're trying to pull together a eulogy and these kids are like, oh, didn't she once? Or wasn't that? But sometimes they just don't really know anything. Like, who she was before She's just she was mother. subsumed by mm. the identity of mother. Yeah. Tell me about your tragic fishing accident. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, this is, I guess this is another coping mechanism of some kind I came up with so as not to be incredibly confrontational to people. But whenever people just pushed and pushed and pushed, you change your mind. Oh, well, you know, have you tried this technology? Oh, you know, didn't you meet the right bloke? And I, it's just, not too late. There's donor eggs. You could always get donor all these eggs. different things. It would just kind of build in my head that I wanted to scream at them, but I lost my uterus in a tragic fishing accident, and I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I think I just came up with it because I thought that'll make them just shut up and realise that they <laughs> shouldn't. I, I, and I can't. Have you ever done it? it? No, or you've just dreamed I, of it. I, I can't. I'd sort of now I'm like physically trying to work out how it would. <laughs> work. It's such a beautiful mental picture (laughs) with it casting off and the the hook. and Yeah. And sort of shocking enough to shut someone up while they think about it a little bit. And then I guess my hope is (laughs) if I did it, that person would think twice next time before, say, interrogating someone who has had the trauma of not being able to have kids when they want them.
When you're busy, planning and organising dinner can be a struggle. And when you have lots of hungry mouth to feed, like I do, coming up with new recipe ideas they actually enjoy can take time. If you're someone who can relate, it's time to introduce your family to HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers everything you need for easy to prepare meals right to your door. From the pre-portioned fresh ingredients to the variety of delicious recipes, it's as simple as jumping on the HelloFresh app and picking your favourite recipes each week. Now you can leave the dinnertime planning to HelloFresh and start creating meals you know the whole family will love. To sign up, head to hellofresh.com.au and use the code MIA90, that's M-I-A-9-0, at checkout to get a total of $90 off across your first four boxes. Tell me about as a mother. As As a a mother, mother. Tori, how can you possibly understand sadness, grief, joy, happiness, anything? It's used quite a lot. In fact, Jacinda Ardern used it in the wake of the Christchurch massacre and I was like, oh, no, I'm really confused about what I'm saying about this. And, look, again, for me this is just an annoying thing, but if I desperately wanted children I would find it deeply hurtful when that phrase as a mother is used to indicate that it is only as a mother that you can have empathy for your fellow humans or only as a mother that you can feel the tragedy of something that's rolling out around you. And the other slight complication to that is that I have friends who say they do feel more empathy now that they have kids. They feel a lot more worry about the world around them, which I think is a really natural thing. But to use the phrase as a mother implies that you are somehow morally superior to the other women out there who haven't been able to or haven't had kids. How did Jacinda Ardern use the phrase after Christchurch? She, I'm going to paraphrase, it was something like, as a mother, the tragedy here has really struck my heart or something like that. Yeah. And do you know what? Not her fault. At, like, she handled the whole massacre so gracefully and she's handled the crazy stuff that's been thrown at her as someone who became a mother in office and I completely admire her I guess it's just another one of these things that people don't think of how it might impact on on someone when they use it tell me about your relationship with your friends who have kids is there a separation for a time and then a coming back together as the kids get older talk me through the trajectory of how one person having a child can affect a friendship so I would say with my group of friends, there's been some of the natural ebbs and flows. You see slightly less of people with very young children. I think it's completely understandable. And then it depends on individual variants, like the kid that never sleeps versus, you know, the the dream child or whatever. I've heard from a lot of women that they have had, they've lost friends. But then I've also heard more from actually women who have kids that it's other people who've left them or don't want to come around to a messy house or don't want a noisy kid at the pub. So I think that's one of those things that works both ways. There's always going to be natural lifestyle ebb and flow, but anyone who's rejecting a friend because they do or don't have kids, yeah, I think that, I think that's really sad and it's a, it's a misunderstanding and I'm, I'm sure it happens and it must be deeply hurtful. It's more just how close you are to them. Like I find that as my kids got older, mm. I had more in common with my friends who didn't have kids. Mm. Isn't it funny? I keep avoiding using the word childless or child-free. Yeah, they, they're, te- they're not great words. One feels pejorative yeah. and one feels smug, huh. as you say. Smoke-free, drug-free. Yeah. yeah. My friends who don't have kids, I found that I had more in common with them than I did my friends who had little kids. Right. Because our lifestyles were similar. I yep. didn't I I wasn't constrained in that same way that people with little kids are. Yeah, it's all about the lifestyle, I'm sure. And you know, are you working? Are you not working? How many hours are you working? What other supports have you got around to be free to fit in with friends' lifestyles? And like I said, I think a certain amount of change is just always going to happen, but to reject people outright, I just yeah. Are you an only child? No. So one of the things that, that women without kids have to contend with is their pr- the parents. parental pressure. Yeah. Yeah. The parental pressure because they want to become grandparents. Mm. How's that been for you? So it has been fine for me. After those initial – actually, when I was having some of those conversations with my mum about whether it was just a natural course, whether I should just have them, my little brother had already had kids. So that huge weight of pressure was off. They had two small nieces to keep them very busy, as they still do. And ultimately, I think my 
dad would like all the grandchildren in the world, but no expectation on, well, too, you know, too late, dad, but <laughs> no expectation on me to, to produce it. And, you know, I, I guess I don't know what conversations they might have internally or with each other about it. I've worried for a while that they might blame themselves in some way when their friends ask, because of course they got it as well. You know, when's Tori having kids? When's Joe? My sister hasn't got kids either. When's Joe having kids? And I, I felt quite a lot of guilt about that, which is part of the reason I got to that wanting to want phase. How long did that wanting to want phase last just through the time that you actually were trying? And then did you feel that you closed it off or it was more of a slow dawning? I guess I kept thinking it would somehow morph magically into actual wants. Um, and it just never did. And then that regular <laughs> flush of relief at the flush of blood mm. uh, made me realise that this was not the way to, you know, be a people pleaser. I'm looking at your amazing top that you're wearing in the studio sitting opposite me. It's got um, gorgeous Labradors all over it, photographs of Labradors all over it. You do have a dog, mm. but he's not your – he or she – he. He's not your fur baby. No. But well, you people, could call people him a like fur baby. call him your <laughs> yes. fur baby. Tell me about um, that, how people like to project on you the idea that dogs are babies. Yes. Well, I can't remember. You know, fur baby seems like a still relatively recent term. Maybe only sort of the last five years have I, has it become this really common term. It's quite a cute term and I don't mind it. It's only when it's used in this set, oh, you don't have kids. At least you've got your fur, baby. And it, it is just ridiculous. You couldn't treat a child the way I treat that dog. I mean, he's, he's well treated. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not a child. He's not a replacement child. Didn't breastfeed him. Didn't breastfeed him. No need cut, for a babysitter when yeah, you're at work. Cut his balls off, feed him, you know, liver treats and occasionally have to stick things up his bum. I mean, yeah. I, actually, maybe that happens with kids as well. Anyway, he's not a replacement baby. And I guess that's just another example of the assumption that... I desperately want babies and was trying to have a like second rate baby of some kind. Do you worry about who'll look after you when you die? <laughs> that's another uh, it is. argument that's put to you sometimes, isn't it? I think that one's really funny because you often get, oh, you're just really selfish. And then you get, but you should have a baby to wipe your bum when you're old and say, that would be selfish. I have great faith in robots. <laughs> 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 I don't think I'd want as someone I love to wipe my bum. But I think there is a broader demographic issue here with fewer women having babies, ageing populations, and it's not just the physical job of will we have enough people to keep caring for our ageing generation, um, but will we have enough people paying taxes to support that health system? And, I mean, in Australia we make up for it with immigration, but as we know that can um, be a fraught topic in Parliament and you never know what could happen. And in other countries like Japan, it's actually hitting really hard. My favourite stat in there is about how <laughs> adult nappies are now outselling baby nappies in Japan. Oh my, oh my goodness. And that, I mean, they're, they're in some serious strife. They're, they're bringing in immigrants, relaxing some of the visas for the very first time, but they, they live for so long. You know, they've always been one of the longest lived populations. They're having very few kids and that is a whole complicated area but it is you know women started working and the work ethic there is a very long work day so they can't do both there's also something mysterious happening with young people not having sex but the outcome of that is that japan is now the poster child for how bad things can, can get be. yeah well it's confusing isn't it because on one hand people say well the climate's a catastrophe mm. and we've got to stop overpopulating the earth because our resources are finite and then on the other hand you've got when Peter Costello was the treasurer and famously <laughs> said, have one kid for mum, one for dad and one for the country because an ageing population was problematic mm. because you need younger people not just to care for them and wipe their bums but to pay taxes that can be used to support these people after they can work. Mm. So in terms of the conflicted messages about whether we should or shouldn't yeah. have kids beyond our own internal desire... Did you land anywhere on that? No, but I don't think we're having proper conversations around it. There are a lot of countries in the developed world that are, you know, doing this call to duty like Peter Costello, like have one for your country. Uh, they're doing more and more um, pronatalist things, which is great, but they don't... What's pronatalist? Sorry, pronatalist is in favour of child bearing and child rearing. So it's push incentivising, hate that word too, incentivising women to have more children. So it's, look, it's better access to 
to daycare, it's better support networks, it's um, better paternity leave. It's just none of it's really working. So I guess the next big question is, does it matter? Do you feel that there are some ways in which as someone without kids, you are discriminated against in a society that just assumes women will have kids and regards you as almost an outlier if you don't? Yeah. You know, I haven't suffered particularly. I have felt various pressures and, as I've said, the, you know, the relentless messaging. Having said that, there's a really big study in the UK that showed two-thirds of childless workers feel they have to work longer hours. And I do feel that sometimes, like, I have nothing to go home to. Oh, that's sorry, the perception is I do have, I have things. You've got a fur baby. <laughs> yeah, got a Remember fur, your got fur, fur baby. baby. <laughs> You've got to go home and breastfeed the fur baby. That's it. There's a growing tension, and this is, I think, an issue that workplaces need to deal with, but a growing tension between being more supportive of parents and saying, right, yep, you know, you need to go to the school pick up, mum or dad or whoever it is, you need to work from home on that day and having that flexible sort of work, which is absolutely critical. But on the other hand, the people without children don't feel like they have access to any of that. I think that can be really exacerbated by being single as well. Um, you know, you don't, you're the one who has to wait at home for the tradie and your workplace might not understand that that's how that works. A lot of those flexible things don't apply. And even when we, we talk about work-life balance, we go work-life balance for a man is work and then, you know, a bit of play, a bit of pub, a bit of golf. Work-life balance for a woman is work and then work at home with the kids or the domestic duties. So where does that leave the woman without children? What's her work-life balance look like? And... A lot of research has found, and I have sensed this from people, they don't sort of really think that you, you need one because women only need a life that includes, you know, home and babies. In budgets, there's so much emphasis on working families mm. and... Mum and, and dad investors. And, yeah. Mm. Does, it, is, does that feel excluding? It does. It does. And it also feels a little bit befuddling when you realise that we are heading towards this place where there are more households without children than there are with children. It just seems to me that this norm is continuing in the way that people talk, this expectation, this narrative of this is what a woman's life looks like. And it's just quietly changing and no one's kind of keeping up with that. And there's some things that only other women without children understand? I actually don't think so. I think that every time I speak to women with children properly, not in the confrontational, you know, small talk awkwardness sense. No, they do understand it. And I think one of the things I keep trying to refer to in the book is that these are the flip sides of the same coin. So women with children also suffer from all these stigmas from, you know, the gender pay gap, all these different things, because women keep getting judged on how many babies they've had, whether they've had babies at all, have they started having babies, will they have babies in the future... And I guess particularly in a workplace setting, it just means they go from one discrimination to the next mm. without a break. Have you noticed there's a difference in the way that men react to finding out that you don't have kids to women? One thing I've noticed in actually since since the book is a lot of men saying, look, I found this really hard to talk about. And because they're not captured in the statistics, that's this whole kind of world of unknown how men feel about it. I mean, in one sense, theirs is a different experience. I don't think they have the same stigma attached and they certainly don't have the same life disruption from having kids versus not having kids. But no one's kind of looked into their emotional life around that or how does a man feel if his wife doesn't want to have kids and he does? I mean, you can't go force on that one, right? Mm -mm. That's not a world we want. Um, and what they can possibly do in that case. And it it's also hard to... Uh, tease out from the sort of poultry research that there is, like, what's it like for gay men and what's it like for gay women? And, you know, it's easier to get a sperm than a uterus, but these these are pretty big barriers that, that people are facing. And, again, there's, there's no one kind of having the nuanced conversations about why. And what about men and women who do have children? How Have you noticed any any sort of similarities in how they react? Like, are the men, like... You should, you should, you should. And mm. do some women say, oh, my God, I'm so jealous? Well, not quite I'm so jealous. <laughs> I did have, when, I, when I launched the book, I was being interviewed by Nikki Vincent, who's the Equal Opportunity Commissioner. And now 
that was fascinating because she had children very young and now has nine grandchildren and is a foster parent as well. And she had two kids from a first marriage and two from a second marriage. And she said, oh, I just realised that I never thought about it. And if I had have thought about it, I might not have started so early or I might not have had, had so many. And quite a few women are like that. And then there are others who feel a little bit more challenged by it and, you know, still others who are like, you should just do it. Who are your role models? Like, you know how you sort of look to women who are you but just a bit further down the track? Yeah. Um, a whole range of women actually in Parliament. I kind of think they can all also be arseholes sometimes. But then I also have genuinely appreciated spending a lot of time in Canberra watching the likes of of Penny Wong, of Julia Gillard, of Julie Bishop, of Sarah Hanson Young. Wow, I just went multi-partisan. Did you mm, see that? I, I think was I just, very, very... Uh, not Pauline Hanson, though. Careful. Not no. that even-handed. But when you look at the women, I suppose the area in which there are most women mm. who don't have children and they seem to be overrepresented mm. compared to other areas of the population is in Parliament. Yeah. So Julie Gillard, Julie Bishop, Michaela Cash, I'm sure there are more. And so is that a good thing? No. It's, it, I don't think it's a good or a, or a bad thing. I mean, I think the parliament should be... Amanda rep- Vanstone. <laughs> I think the parliament should be representative of the community around it. But it is also virtue. I, I cannot imagine how you would travel to Canberra 26 weeks a year from where you live easily. And I'm also inspired by Amanda Rishworth, South Australian MP. She got her husband to take paternity leave and he's been the primary carer for their first kid and I think their soon to be second kid unless he's been born. Sorry, Amanda. And I mean, that was that was news. You know, that was a news yarn. Man becomes primary carer for a baby. So there are little ways all the time that those little barriers are being broken. It's just a lot slower and theoretically more controversial than I would have thought or liked. I love, Tori, that your book is told through the lens of freedom. It's called On Freedom. And instead of looking at it in terms of what's missing from your life, it is through that component of what's there because of the choice you've made not to have children. Just to sort of wrap up, can you describe what that freedom's like and how it it continues to sort of make its presence felt in your life as this living choice that you're that you'll be making until the end of time because we know that <laughs> yeah. you've still got the option you could still change you could still do it yeah well for me I really wanted to tease out the fraught nature of freedom the difficulties of that freedom about how everything was supposed to be better now we were supposed to be able to have it all we do have the freedom to say I don't want kids but we don't yet have the freedom to say that without repercussions women still aren't free of all that attachment to motherhood as being the sole identity. So for me, freedom was just a nice way to start breaking open. We've done some things. We haven't done everything. And I guess to express empathy for those who don't have as much freedom as I've had. What's been the reaction? Really nice. I've done something wrong. I really... (laughs) What do you mean you've done something wrong? You know what it is? It's because my normal... Most reactions I see are angry people on Twitter and in the comments on stories (laughs) that I write online. And I think I started to think that was the world and it's not. A lot of people just want to have a a conversation about their their journeys towards motherhood or not motherhood or about being a woman. And, yeah, yeah, no no one's even threatened to hurt me in some way yet. <laughs> I love how that's your frame of reference. It's like no death threats yet. Yeah. Things are going well. well What's maybe, going on? Maybe I should have got more controversial somehow. <laughs> I don't know. I think what you've done is given a gift to so many women who will feel seen after reading your book and feel understood and feel represented because it is a story that is so often told through a prism of disappointment or lacking. And what you've done is even for those people who might not have been voluntarily without children, they in turn will come to see and understand some of the freedoms that come with that decision, even if it was taken out of their own hands as a choice. I hope so. You can find Tori's book on freedom at any good bookstore. And if you like this interview, here's another one you might enjoy. My interview with author Stephanie Wood 
who wrote a book about how she fell in love with a man online who turned out to be a fake. If you like Dirty John, you'll like this interview with Stephanie Wood. We'll pop a link in our show notes for that one. No Filter is produced by Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman, and you can sign up for my newsletter at miafriedman.com.au. I'll see you on Mamma Mia. This episode of No Filter was brought to you by HelloFresh. Inspiration delivered.